Podcast number three with my good friend of mine, Eddie Ferrara. Eddie's coming to us from New York City, so we're doing this this one remotely. Um, had Eddie on the having Eddie on the podcast because he's uh, really smart, which is always <laughs> what we're looking for here on the podcast. Got a lot of great things to say, and Eddie's um, really knowledgeable about things like economics and. And um, that's, that's not entirely true. <laughs> Don't well, build me up too hard here. Uh, fair enough. But we're going to, I mean, you are, you, you're, you're a smart kid, one of the smartest kids I've known. So we're hoping to have a good conversation about things that actually matter. So, all right. and one of those things is economics and because it's one of those things that affects all of us, even if we sometimes don't realize it. So yes. Eddie, thank you for coming on the podcast, man. Great to have you. Uh, great to be here, Justin. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course, man, no <laughs> doubt. So, um, yeah, Eddie, just if you could tell the listeners that don't know you, I'm sure a lot of you do know Eddie, but those that don't, um, you know, kind of uh, your background a little bit, what you're up to these days, and um, and yeah. All right. Well, um, what's up? My name's Eddie. <laughs> I graduated from UMass, same as Justin. I... Lived with him for three years in college. Yeah, yeah, good times. Um, yeah, we did a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of crazy stuff. <laughs> well, we won't get into that stuff just, <laughs> just on this podcast because, you yeah, know, it's all for the children, everything right. we do. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I studied sociology. I studied, um, what the hell did I study? <laughs> in- inter- interpretation and international relations as well. Uh, studied abroad in Brazil. I am living in New York. I have been for about a year. I've been working for a disaster relief nonprofit in Staten Island and Brooklyn called Tunnel to Towers um, that is dedicated to rebuilding people's homes that have been destroyed by Hurricane Sandy Mm -hmm. in, I think, 2013? Was it 2012 even? I think it was 2012 was was Hurricane Sandy. (laughs) I should probably know that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so 2012. We're coming up on two years with that. Um, yeah, and now I, I'm living in Brooklyn right now and working there as well. Right on, man. Yeah, so that's what I'm up to. Great. Yeah, so so wanted to have you on to talk, um, as I said, a bit about economics. So, you know, we were, we were talking earlier about, uh, well, we talk about all sorts of shit all the time, but, but specifically <laughs> uh, with regards to, to economics and economic policy, um, here in Massachusetts, the the new the new minimum wage increase, um, and I think it's gone to what is it like ten ten bucks an hour something like that. I, I think it's being pushed to eleven, but uh, good for you yeah. for not knowing. It's, yeah, see you're doing well. Yes, yeah, so, you know I'm doing doing my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that is a good thing. If you don't know the minimum wage, it probably <laughs> probably doesn't yeah. affect you. Um, hope I didn't elim- <laughs> alienate a bunch of people. Sorry. Um, (laughs) but so yeah, 11. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty big. So yeah, I don't know if it's there yet or they're, they're, you know, it's going to get there. I'm not sure how or when. Yeah. Which, which is really, seems really high to me, you know, um, you you know, when, when I was, you know, in in high school and college working minimum wage jobs, you know, it was like, I mean, when I first started, I think it was 625 an hour. Um, yeah, wow, that was high school, right? Yeah, you know that was what eight years ago, not that long. So it's it's you know almost doubled in in about eight years. Right, so, and obviously our money is not worth half what it was eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so it seems like it's 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 increasing higher than inflation. So yeah, far far quicker than inflation, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So so. 
Why is that? Do you think it's because back when we were working on those minimum wage wages that we were just drastically underpaid? Um, or, or is it now that, you know, they, we want to have minimum wage actually, yeah, it was, we were drastically on a page and now we want minimum wage to really keep up with it, with a higher standard of living. So that's kind of the first question. And then the second question is really, is this a good thing? (laughs) Is this good for the economy as a whole? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the answer to the two of them is sort of the same, in my opinion, I don't want to like, I don't want to come out like saying I'm some kind of expert on this situation or anything, you know, because I'm not. But um, it seems to me that the reason that people make laws like a minimum wage law um, and, you, and, you know, raise it is that they're aiming to improve standard of living for the people who have the worst standard of living. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so obviously that targets the people who are making the least money and you think give them more money better quality of life. Pretty simple. Yep. But um, I think the reality of it is that it's sort of a backwards attempt because a thing like minimum wage is, while benevolent, more symptomatic of, uh, of the entire economic picture that you're working within. And less of, it's less of the cause and more of the effect than people tend to think it is. Okay, interesting. Can you explain what you mean by, by the cause and effect? Yeah. Well, okay. So at its most benevolent, a thing like minimum wage is there to basically like protect people who don't have high paying skills, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. So, yeah. So you think, um, okay, you assign a certain monetary value to the hours of their work and you say it's illegal to pay someone less than this. And um, that's it's like a really simple approach to trying to combat poverty. Yeah. But what you're actually doing is probably creating unemployment when you implement a policy like that, especially when you see large hikes in minimum wage, like what Massachusetts is about to go through. Yeah. So basically, when you have a minimum wage of X dollars an hour, what you're doing is you're preventing anyone who could who has skills that are not worth X amount of dollars an hour from making any dollars an hour. You understand? Like, essentially, you are eliminating those jobs or forcing them on to other people who already, you know, have responsibilities and are now overburdened with them. Right. Yeah, I understand. Interesting. So I I understand that point. And I think the question is, so as an example, right, like someone, if someone can do work for you, Mm -hmm. but the work they're doing is not actually worth $11 an hour, let's say it's worth five. Yeah. You're not going to, as a business owner, you wouldn't hire them because... You're You're losing value. Six dollars an hour. Right. Exactly. So that person, in essence, is going to end up without a job altogether. Yeah, pretty much. And then because of that, their existence or their, uh, what's like a better way of saying that, (laughs) their needs are going to be subsidized by the common taxpayer because they, we have a system in place where we, you know, we take care of our people that can't find work or can't, or aren't working at the moment. Right. I see. Yeah. So. No, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but yeah. Okay, so, so you have that right there. You're putting more people on like the, on the, you know, the system of being cared for by everyone else, basically like through taxes. So people are losing money through that. Any productivity that would have been created by those people who could have jobs at a lesser um, wage is now non-existent, and therefore we're deprived of the products that they could produce, which leads to you know less supply same amount of demand prices go up basically everyone's money is worth less because we can purchase less with it yep yeah i i i i I agree with that 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 makes a lot of sense on a from a from a strictly economical standpoint it it limits the the amount of what you said your buying power right you know it's yeah yeah and it's going to lower the the GDP of a country or in this case, a state like Massachusetts, because you can't produce as much because labor is more expensive and therefore goods are going to be more expensive and things like that. Exactly. Therefore every dollar goes less far and you might as well have not raised the minimum wage at all. Right. And you're also saying that we are in, in essence still paying for these people anyway. 
because they're, you know, on now unemployment or they're, you know, they're, they're receiving benefits from, from the, the, the systems that we have in place to, to care for them. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, you're not allowing them to provide for themselves. And I think, um, pretty much anyone would agree that making some money is better than making no money. Yeah. Do you think it should be eliminated? Um, so not, not really. I don't think it should be eliminated, um, entirely. Although I, it's hard to know where to keep it. If you're going to have it, where is it? Because, you know, when you see people trying to regulate the price of anything, and really wage is just the price of labor. Labor is another commodity, just like apples or something or gasoline. Yeah. And we've seen time and time again when um, commodities or goods or services are, is prorated the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Well, you're saying there's a, there's government regulation to yeah, control yeah. pricing of certain things. Right? Exactly. A- anytime you say that something is not worth what strictly what people are willing to pay for it, um, it leads to a lot of complications, which is what, you know, now that's why we're having this discussion here. What is the price of someone who just flips burgers? Like, to the restaurant, maybe it doesn't make sense to hire them for $11 an hour, but maybe... You know, I think it's um it's largely a political decision, mm-hmm. and I think that there, as we experience a growing number of people earning those jobs, they become sort of a, a powerful political constituent that people would like to get on their sides. And obviously, there are more restaurant employees than restaurant owners. So if you're going to have to piss one group off, I would go with the owners. It's a numbers game. Yeah, no, that that's a good point, and. So here's kind of the flip side of that argument, though, right? If you de deregulation also has its drawbacks as well. Like we see, for example, you know, famous case, the Enron case, electricity prices got deregulated mm-hmm. in California. So what Enron did is they had the power to, because they were such a huge energy provider and also had the ability to, you know, they were in selling and and investing in energy, they had the power to control the supply of electricity to California during these times. So they would like, you know, shut off a power plant (laughs) and electricity prices would skyrocket and they would, you know, they would make a, a killing off this type of stuff. Yes. And that is obviously bad for the consumer. Right. It's very bad. So in in some cases, I think regulation, you know, is needed, right? Because people left to their own devices can be really devious fucks sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, So we can swear on this thing. Yeah, yeah, we can swear on this. I've sworn a bunch on Fuck, this, man. Fuck, titties, bitches. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, all right. Oh, there's another one. Yeah, there man. We, we can swear on this thing. It's all good. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you can make a more salient point by swearing please do (laughs) so all right so in response to your enron comments yeah um the the difference between those these two situations is the lack of competition in the enron case Mm -hmm. if there were another power plant or, or power supplier that could undercut them then they would and then everyone why would you ever pay more for the same product willingly like we have to you have to sort of assume that everyone is going to aim for the most efficient products because really we are. Um, basically, if you can get something, you, if you can get item A for $5 and item B, which is the same as item A for $4 and of the same exact quality, no one would ever buy item A except for like, you know, reasons, um, sort of non, non-financial non reasons. Like maybe they, they like the company better or like their grandson works there or something, you know. Right. But um but as long as competition is encouraged between employers, which in a in a minimum wage job setting it really is always going to be, then I don't see I don't necessarily see the need for that specific regulation. For a minimum be- wage, you're saying? Yes, because an employee is always if assuming their motives are financial, which usually working is for money, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, they're always going to go where they can get the most money or do if you know like that sounds <laughs> that sounds sort of uh, wrong, but <laughs> basically if they can sweep floors 
in store A and make $10 an hour, or they can sweep floors in store B and make $12 an hour. Nine times out of 9.1 times, they're going to go to store B. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. So, but there's a fine line because we don't work, we don't live in a strictly economic uh, world, right? You know, what, what, what is best for the economy mm-hmm. isn't necessarily best for the people of that economy, if that makes sense. Like free market will serve, you know, a free market will serve to maximize GDP, mm-hmm. you know, and increase obviously the most good GDP, but, but it's not necessarily going to increase the quality of life for everyone living in there. It's going to create this, the middle class is going to, to, to disappear, right? You're going to, you're going to see, you know, people working for really low amounts of money, flipping burgers, and then the business owner making tons of money because now they're paying their, you know, their employees pennies, pennies. So you're creating this real, uh, well, not, I don't really agree with that statement, okay. to be honest. Um, so I think what ultimately what a free market economy encourages is efficiency mm-hmm. and everything being done by the people who are best doing it, pretty much. Like if, if we're talking on a global scale, you know, the classic example of uh, tariffs on foreign goods. And basically what you're doing is you're forcing an industry to exist in a place where it, it shouldn't. And the people are really paying for that. If all goods are available at their cheapest price, we all win because we all need those goods. You see, like in so in a way, I know what you're saying because you're assuming that people are going to be crushed essentially under the under the power of those who already have money in the in the beginning. Right. But work, but work creates work, and um, your supply is also your demand. You know, if you pay an employee like they use that money to go and buy whatever they need. That's, you know, that's the way we exchange goods and services through money. And so, um, forcing, forcing that, that transaction to happen in an unnatural and, uh, well, forced manner is, is not really, um, beneficial to the people who are being made to live in that society or system, even though it may appear so sometimes. And some granted, sometimes it, it is. Some things should be regulated. Right. I mean I, I, I would think if you asked a McDonald's worker this question, they'd be <laughs> they would they would disagree with you, right? Because you are now taking away their ability to make a living. Well I I could see like, yeah, they the person working at McDonald's would definitely think that this is in their best interest. And last night I went out and drank so much gin that I couldn't move this morning. And I thought that was awesome last night, but you know what? It wasn't. So, so you're saying, well, so you're saying if you talk to a minimum wage worker now and explain this, this thought process, Hey, this is actually good for you in the long run. You know, you're not going to make $11 now now, you're now going to make four, but it's good for you. I because think, that four will do what twelve would do if you were making eleven or something, you know. Well, that's 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 a I, that's an interesting. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I could be. I'm not sure. But for me, it just seems like that money is coming out of McDonald's. You know, if we're using McDonald's as an example, their bottom line profits. So if McDonald's is making twenty billion dollars a year, and now they're going to make you know, let's say 17 billion or 15 billion because they have to pay their employees a livable wage. Is that so bad? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, if you put it like that, no, it's, it's not so bad, but let's say they want to maintain the same profit margin. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to. Well, they could, if they, there's a couple, there's like, basically it would, the consumer would have to subsidize that by paying more. So you think they would just chart? Okay, so I see what you're saying. So McDonald's would be like, screw that, right? Like our profits yeah. are going to stay the same, so we're charging more money for a cheeseburger. Right, and therefore, what the cheeseburger that used to cost you one dollar has now now cost you two. Therefore, your dollar is worth half as much at McDonald's. And if you extrapolate that point and sort of apply it to every industry, right, that's pretty much what you'll see. Yeah, interesting. That's that's a good point.
let's not forget the reason people have businesses oftentimes is to you know make money. That's like I'm, okay, that's a huge blanket statement. Well, that's not that's, true. I mean, that's a big part of it. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's say a good business needs to have money. It needs to make money. Yes, it does. Otherwise, it's a hobby, not a business. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that's always going to be true. So people are just people. The consumer will lose every time in that. Yeah, well, well, I also saw, I saw a recent, um, I saw a billboard, well, I didn't see it in person, but it was online, and it was, it was a picture, it was against raising the minimum wage in, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and it was saying, it was saying, don't do it, because if the minimum wage gets high enough, what they're going to do is, business is going to look for alternative solutions, and this ad was like showing a robot, I think it was like flipping a burger or something. Uh -huh. And it's like, you know, you can get cut out of the system altogether. <laughs> right. And like I said, better to make something than nothing. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. But see, this, this is all. <laughs> but then you look at other countries that do things a very different way, right? You, let's say you look at the Nordic countries, you know? Yeah. And they're killing it. <laughs> like the quality of life in those places is through the roof, through all you know statistical measures you know that pe yeah. people's you know uh health is covered their you know their schooling that the the minimum wage is sky high and as a society they seem to be doing really really well i mean they have beautiful cities and, and culture and and all this stuff yes um correct me if i'm wrong don't we supply their military we basically are the military for a lot of those countries through like nato treaties and stuff like that um i don't know specifically for those those nordic countries um but it, they're definitely our allies so yeah I'm well sure, yeah sure we so do. um there's a couple a couple crucial differences between a country like america and a country like uh i don't know like norway or something yeah um just size first of all we're yeah huge and what and when you have a small country that's largely ethnically homogenous um and people tend to be of a, a you know a similar mind and have share phenotypical characteristics and they all share the same culture for the most part um it's it's probably easier to get on board with more socialist policies like that but in america we are we're an incredibly diverse nation especially in comparison with the northern european countries yep so um, I don't really see that as a, as a viable option for us. But why not? Because of, just because of size of the country? I mean, I well, think... Because of size, because of our, the people here, like we're not of all one mind and body. We're very different from each other. Um, I personally don't feel very connected to people in Utah or whatever. You know, I'm from the Northeast. I don't... I don't even know that part of the country at all. So why it's kind of hard to like get behind working for each other right. when you don't know each other and you can't relate to each other. Right. That, I mean, that's, that is a great point. And I think America was, America has gotten huge. And I think what's happened is, I know we've talked about this in the past is, <laughs> um, you know, the fact that, Things are done on, on a national scale on, at the federal level when I think, you know, a lot of these decisions should be made on the state level, which would, you know, when it comes to economic policies, social policies, things like that. And that, that way people can live in the states that represent how they want to live, right? And their, their, vote, their votes have more power as well. Like I vote in a federal, you know, federal election for the president. My vote is means jack shit, right? Yeah, I mean, basically. Yeah. Drop of water in an ocean. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. But if I vote for my local congressman who then represents my interests and the int interests of my community, you know, in the, in, that I live in today, of a small community at the, at the Massachusetts Congress, then, you know, I actually have a legitimate say, right? Or like much more of one anyway. Yeah, yeah. And my, my views are being represented much, much better. So, and I th what's, what's happened in America over time is that, you know, it, it was the United States of America, right? It's, <laughs> it's, this, it's, it's, it's on a state level. 
these, you know, the states were, had their own constitutions and, and the federals, the federal government was set up, you know, just for, for rules of in, interstate commerce and, and military, which, you know, we, we still need that stuff. But all these, these massive federal regulations that affect such a huge diverse population is really screwing us up. And I think it's causing a lot of, you know, this, this polarized attitude that people have in our country, you know, I mean, the country's never been more divided, like Democrats or Republicans can't even talk to it. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, you know, they have a 9% approval rating in, in Congress and like no one's happy right now. So I think a change needs to be made somehow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, I think if, if states were allowed to run their, their shit on their own, I think people would be a lot happier overall. Yeah, state autonomy is pretty dope. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to put it in a really colloquial manner. Yeah. State autonomy, I think I agree with you, actually. Um, I didn't always, but I do now. Yeah. About Woo! that. Very rare, very rare I, you have a, convinced someone of your ways. It's, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I convince you, probably your own readings and stuff, but. Hell it yeah. was you and Cliver. <laughs> Cliver, yeah. <laughs> Libertarianism, baby. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, state, you know, some states may want to set up systems like that and uh, you know, like we had the healthcare in Massachusetts, the healthcare system that um what's it called that the what's the real Obamacare what's the real name of Obamacare uh the Affordable Care Act there we go thank you yeah. so that you know that's based on Republican Governor Mitt Romney or was it Mitt Romney yeah yeah it was his plan for Massachusetts and, yeah um, which is amazing because <laughs> I know and then he went and opposed it yeah like it's like he was like oh that's horseshit it's like dude you literally created this is, this. this is your idea bro you know what do you what is you are just the most hypocritical fuck i've ever met or not met but but seen on but TV. talked about on a podcast <laughs> yeah it's just like you know and also thing with Mitt romney man the guy has never had a beer in his entire life there's something wrong with that there's something wrong i can't you can't have a leader of the country who's never had a beer like i just don't trust you <laughs> it's like really you've never once tried like oh what what what's the big deal like has he never drank or just never had a beer he i don't think he's ever drank oh because i would have left a whiskey guy or like a gin <laughs> oh, guy, you know <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> this definitely. country running right <laughs> yeah man i mean that's what our presidents were in the past man i mean andrew jackson he drank yeah, there were <laughs> they were also slave slave owners and like maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's true, Fair, valid point. But um, you know, they they had their their faults as well. But 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 they drank, you know. And there's bad like Andrew Jackson was. <laughs> I I there's a story about him that he he was fighting the um, the uh, the Seminoles in Florida. Him and his crew, his his army. And they were, he couldn't get them to fight, right? Because they were just getting drunk every night, his whole army. And he was like, all right, I need to, like, motivate these guys, right? I need them to stop drinking so we can win this this battle, like this war. And, you know, and so one, one night he challenged, he goes, okay. He gathered up his whole army and he goes, all right, if anyone in this army can outdrink me, we can just, like, keep party or whatever but but if i out drink every single one of you if you guys are done we're not drinking anymore and we are like you know wiping the floor with these seminoles and like yeah so the story is he got up to 34 shots right he got to 25 <laughs> shots of whiskey everyone else capped out and he did 10 more just to prove a point now that's a president. That's a bad, that's a leader right there. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> and then he went and eliminated, you know, banks and all that stuff. But <laughs> like you say, he's probably hammered. <laughs> he probably was. I don't need this banking shit. <laughs> Take my money. We don't need money. I'd trade him whiskey. <laughs> and now he's on the $20 bill, which is kind of ironic. Well, there you go. Success story in the end. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's 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 great stuff. It really is. 
I, I love like just the United States history and, and it's cra- it's cr- it's a crazy history, you know? It's, yeah. It's it's just so so new and so so like quick to happen and violent and there were no rules. It was it was, it was a like a meteoric uh volatile rise to world domination. Yeah, that's what it volatile. It was like yeah, that's the great word. It was like everyone was living all over the world, hated their lives. And they're like, all right, well this America place I can there's really no rules yet, so I can just go there and do whatever I want and become something. And it's it's I mean it's what made what made America great. But at the same time it's created this this history that's really fascinating and also really a lot of fucked up things have happened here you know in a short <laughs> amount of time like <laughs> yeah it's been it's been a crazy 400 or so years <laughs> <laughs> yeah not even man it's been like 300 really oh well okay yeah since like the 1620 yeah 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 like 400 <laughs> i was thinking since america but yeah since people people have been here you know yeah oh well i mean people have been here since forever right see i'm i'm proving my own ignorance <laughs> so, just people know there were people here a long time before white people <laughs> yeah. yes i was reading um uh history of the united states by howard zinn have you ever read that no never well it's 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 a book it's about kind of the other side of history in the united states told by he wouldn't say this he has a very eloquent um way of going about it but essentially it's it's the loser's point of view, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's the point of view of, uh, like, you know, the the Arawak Indians when Columbus came, <laughs> like, you know, and, and stuff like that. Like, it, yeah. And it, it's, it gives a really unique perspective on, on the United States and, and it's How did he get that? How, like, where are these sources coming from? Typically those people that lose in history don't live very long yeah yeah no it's it's he has a lot of first first hand sources um like it's kind of impressive. rare yeah it's 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 a well researched book it's it's really really good i i recommend checking it out if, if you're into history or anything like that um, all right cool yeah man. i am and well, i am so. i know i know for the listeners if they're into history i know you are so the listeners the listeners Hello. yes <laughs> you know like my mom and <laughs> maybe my mom maybe your mom who knows yeah actually i don't think my mom listens so <laughs> she, she's off doing her own thing um nice. yeah so going going back to to economics for a second and regulation because i think it's kind of one of the key things that governments are struggling with is what to regulate and what not because there's a fine line between f- the values of free market and protecting, you know, the, the citizens, right? And protecting, you know, we, we have legislation to prevent monopolies, right? And everyone yes. agrees that that's a good thing. But, yeah. you know, if free market is allowed to reign, there would be monopolies. And monopolies actually pro- are the most efficient way of producing goods. Um. Yeah, unless they turn on you, like in the Enron scenario from earlier, and then they're incredibly inefficient. That's what I'm saying. So where do we, how do we navigate? So, yeah. Um, how do we, how do we make rule, like, how, how do we set policy? And I guess the question is, should there be one policy, right? Should we follow a, a, a school of thought when it comes to economics as a country, or should we just deal on with shit on a case to case basis? Uh, Um, wow. Yeah. Let's see. So (laughs) coming at you. (laughs) A la Timlin. You're on the hot seat. So, um, if you deal with things on a case by case basis and there's that leaves room for hypocrisy and illogical steps and conclusions to be made. uh, I don't really think that's, necessarily a good idea um but of course not every situation is the same like they are different um how (laughs) give me give me something to go off here ask me like a specific question (laughs) okay let me let me think so for example in um okay so something we deal with with crowd solar is 
investment ver verifications, right? It's you have to be what's called an accredited investor to invest in in our, our offering and lots of and most financial services, right? To make okay. so, and basically what that means is to be a credit investor, you have to be essentially a high net worth individual, right? You have to make over two hundred thousand dollars a year, or have a million dollars in assets, or if if married, three hundred thousand dollars combined. So so you're well off. Okay. And the thought behind that is these are people that are sophisticated enough or have enough cushion that if they make an investment, they'll be they can take the hit if it goes bad. But oh, that is really interesting. Yes. And this and I really think it's a bad thing because it limits investment opportunities a to the people that are already rich yes. right so poor people can't get in on something that that's really great and, <laughs> it's a hell of a job doing product placement <laughs> it's really great i'm not talking about me specific this is for all like mo pretty much all equity investing in, in private equity like if you wanted to you know invest in a company that you thought was great that you weren't family or friends with had that tie there, you are not allowed to unless you are accredited. You yeah. Know? So that yeah. really limits uh, a lot of things. It limits the capital. It limits the access to capital for companies uh, from a bunch of people that aren't rich but you know still have money. Yeah. Um, and and it, it it limits investment offering. Yeah. It, let's it, let's not also let's um not skip over the fact that it's it's uh, essentially limiting someone's freedom to do what they want with their money, which is theirs. Exactly. And I think it's America, right? <laughs> you, you should be, I checked. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. You should be allowed to do whatever you want with your money. You know, it may not be smart if you're making $20,000 a year to invest 10 grand in a risky startup, but yes, that you is undeniably stupid. Undeniably not, stupid. For our listeners, do not do that. Right. But you had the liberty to do that. Or you yes, should. you have to be able to make your own choices, succeed when you make your own successes, and you know the other side of that coin is fail when you fail. Right. But here's the other side. This is why this kind of stuff is is on the books, so to speak. You see things like the 2008 collapse, right? Mm -hmm. Where yeah, <clears throat> there's all these investment offerings that people that are unsophisticated that don't deal with financial, you know, struct, you know, these structures are getting their life savings tied up into things that um, that are inherently very risky. And th this these laws are on the books to protect these people. But is this a law made after that happened? Um I don't I don't think so, actually. I think it, it was So then that, clearly they're not protecting these people. Yeah, I agree. I think they're just they're the idea is I mean you're protecting them from themselves, right? That's kind of how it's how it's Going. It's a very paternalistic sort of. I don't really like that. Yeah, I don't at all. I don't either. So, you know, I I guess my question is, and I'm not expecting you to have the answer because if you did, you know, you you would be changing the world completely. But here we go. <laughs> like like you know, when do we choose to regulate and when don't we? And is um, is it on a case by case basis or do we follow? Is there a certain code to follow in economics, which is, okay, this is something that needs to be regulated by a government entity. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, holy shit. I do not know the answer to that question, but I will, I'll give it a good shot or my best shot. Okay. Um, so I would say like, it should be like sort of a, a snow globe kind of thing. Like there's a ceiling that obviously like you don't want monopolies. Monopolies are bad for the consumer. They're bad for uh, marginal producers of the same product. It creates theoretically unemployment unless this business is expanding eternally. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't have monopolies. Every pretty much everyone stands to lose except the the monopoly in question. Um, but other than that, and also. Well, the, I guess the counter to that, like the other side of that is unions for the workers. I uh, Unions have kind of like gotten away from where what they were at one point, And now I think like the, the consumer at large is sort of 
losing at the hand of of some, I should say, some like corrupt union practices. Yeah. So I don't know if those are necessarily great either. Um, basically, you want to stop large or powerful groups of people from colluding and screwing everyone else. Mm -hmm. that, and that that like I'm not like the most hardcore free market guy out there. Like, so I would say that you at that level is where you want to intervene. Right. But anything below that, really, as long as competition is being encouraged, I think you should kind of just let it be. Um, you, also, I would say anything environmental, because with what we know about the, the state of the world and um, how pollution is affecting all of us, like the, the radioactive material in Japan is poisoning people via the fish in California. Or, you know, that yeah. stuff that is like that affects us on a global level. I think that is where people need to get together and um, maybe make some lines in the sand and say, all right, this isn't right. We're not going to do this anymore because X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that should be the job of governments, right? To step in and be like, hey, we're, you know, the government is serves the people, right? So it should, it's, it's, supposed, should, to. it's supposed to. And I think, I think if we got money out of politics, right, so they weren't taking, you know, campaign contributions from huge companies and things like that, then th those type of decisions would would be happening. Um, it, it, the, the governments w w would be looking out for, for what the people want, because right now, I, I would think most of the people want that kind of stuff, right, but it's, it doesn't, it doesn't always happen, you know, it doesn't. Um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't also like saying that like the government serves the people, therefore it should be used to give the people what they want is also like a really problematic uh, a, a look into the function of government in our day to day lives. I don't I don't necessarily think the government exists to give you what you want. I think it should exist to allow you to give yourself what you want. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, like, th th absolutely. And uh, it's not the I job of of the taxpayer at large to subsidize really that much for the individual but you should always you know you sh your freedom should be protected your your life liberty uh property pursuit of happiness whatever you want like so the constitution <laughs> should be protected yeah. well yeah i mean and yeah, of, course, of course my my thinking is shaped by the american school system i grew up in and reading all these things all my life but i i really do think that like at its core that's what we should be focusing on and the little stuff like let people figure out for themselves but you said yourself we should be doing things to encourage you know the protection of the environment and and things like that so i did i did and yeah i think that yeah when when things happen on an international level basically you need actors who are going to take the place of the vast groups of individuals that make up the country like we need a state department we need we need foreign ambassadors. We need uh, anyone, really, to represent us. And part of that is to make laws that, or, you know, try our best to make laws with other countries, you know, set sanctions on countries that are fucking up, like Russia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, big time. <laughs> um, yeah. And that is a pretty essential function of government to me. Uh -huh. So I don't mind too much when regulation happens on that level. But interestingly, I've, and I haven't actually fact-checked this at all. I might not want to say this. Go ahead, say it. If it's right, wrong, we'll call, it, we'll, we'll call you out. All right, sounds good. So New Orleans, the levee's breaking there. Um, I have heard that I, it was one of your, your awesome Nordic countries that you love so much. I don't <laughs> know which one. <laughs> so I won't, I won't guess. But um, the state of Louisiana was approached by them. And they asked them if they, if that country, whatever it was, could rebuild or like help them rebuild these dams or levees rather. And that's illegal for a state to make a contract with another uh, government. We don't allow that under our, I forget which, which part of our constitution, but it's, it doesn't happen. Right. So the Army Corps of Engineers stepped in. They said, no, like you can't do this. We got it. And they did nothing. <laughs> and people got completely screwed and maybe that didn't need to happen. So you're saying it's, we, we, uh, Louisiana should have been allowed to 
have a contract with one of these Nordic countries to fix the levies? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I don't see the reason why not. Right. Like what, what's, what, what I harm is coming from it? In that situation, nothing maybe, but like there's definitely potential for sh- for stuff to go crazy. If you have 50 individual states dealing with other nations. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, I certainly understand that because what happens in Louisiana, because we're we're one country, does affect, you know, me in Massachusetts in some way, right? <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, FEMA is FEMA is all over there, like doing an awesome job, <laughs> using tax money to do it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Ugh. It's it's so complicated everything. <laughs> no it wonder is. why we haven't fixed it. Like it's 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 paralyzing. It's too it's almost too complex, you know, especially on a on now the economy's on a global level. It's yeah. like it's it's there aren't there aren't easy answers. There aren't I I guess what I, I'm looking for you know a, a a an ideology that's that's the best, but I don't think there really necessarily is one, right? I think yeah. I think I think it's kind of this hybrid of certain things that are good and, and, and are bad. Like for example, the healthcare system, I think this Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act is this weird hybrid that does nothing for anyone involved, right? It's like <laughs> half socialism, half capitalism. It's like let's just pick one and go that way. Either privatize the whole thing or socialize the whole damn thing and be done with it. Like this is just a weird compromise that no one is seems to be happy about. Yeah, that I I agree with that statement. Yeah. So I don't know. And and, and I think what it is, is 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 as a country and as a society, capitalism is is amazing for what it the opportunity it provides, the growth that can happen, the the uh, ingenuity and innovation that comes out of it. Right. I mean, that's one of the reasons America leads the world in so many things is because there's opportunity. If you have a great idea, you can make a shit ton of money off it. <laughs> you know, if you're in a socialist country, even you know, one of these Nordic countries, you, half your money goes to taxes. With the, the the incentive isn't quite as there as much. You know, so so it, it's really what's made America so great on one hand, but on the other hand, there are these real drawbacks to yeah. to the capitalist society, and it makes things very complicated and. You know, not everyone can can be wealthy and build, be rich. So it's how does a capitalist society take care of those that are less fortunate? It's a, a good question. Um, and once again, I do not know. Yeah, I know. I'm asking you shit that, <laughs> that I don't think anyone really knows. Um, I would say this, though. Like, I would say that on a local level is usually better than on a federal level. Yeah. Um, because you, you're more nuanced with the the people you're dealing with, the situation. Um, if especially when money, when private money is donated, I think that's um, that's like the most efficient and best way to do it. Like uh, the place where I work right now, um, it's funded in part by the government, or at least it was. So, can you explain federal- a little bit what <laughs> what you do to the people that don't know? Yeah, um, I kind of went over it in the beginning. Yeah. Bas- basically, I work for a nonprofit, and we, through some government, some Red Cross, some uh, Home Depot, actually, is was a big help, but, some, you know, various private and city or state funds, we... Do you get any federal funding? We used to. I don't think we do anymore. Okay. Um, but, yeah, we, we use that money, and we go and fix people's homes who essentially don't have the means to do it for themselves. Yeah. Um, So that's obviously, it's a very complicated process. There's a lot to do along the way. Um, But it's, it's handled in Staten Island by a local community organization that existed prior and started to divert funds and energy towards this mission once um, the hurricane hit and decimated the southern part of the island. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are people who are from there. They know some of the people they're helping. They know this situation. They are familiar with everything. And it's if you look at federal attempts to do the same thing, they're usually not nearly as efficient. Yeah, no, definitely not. I mean, there's – yeah, the federal government can't do anything efficiently, it seems. 
It's just it's I mean it's hard, you know, they've got this big massive country to deal with and I I don't fault them for their uh failures, I suppose. <laughs> it's kind of redundant or illogical, but it's it's pretty much impossible to do something as well on such a wide scale. Right. With, with people that don't know like the what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, it I think that's probably true. Although you see in the private sector, you know, companies that are huge do things very well, right? I mean, I couldn't, yes. like, for going back to McDonald's, I mean, is there any place that's better at making a hamburger? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> regardless of whether you like the hamburger or not, right? Like, they have perfected the art of, of you know, supply chains and, and all that. Like, no one can set up a hamburger joint as good as McDonald's can right now. Like, they've perfected it, and they're huge. Yeah. But, you know, obviously the federal government is different than McDonald's. But well, McDonald's is motivated by making money. Well, the that's, federal government isn't is necessarily. Not, that's kind of a huge point. And that's why private sector stuff is much, much more efficient. Yeah, the information relayed by prices and, all you know, the desires of the consumer, supply and demand, these are all sources of information that you, when you eliminate um money essentially from the equation you're missing out on all this information yeah and you're also missing out on on the key driver for for betterment right i mean if let's say exactly if you're providing something and you don't have to worry about going out of business because you get money coming in from taxes every year regardless you're not going to do a good job whereas you're in the private sector you better do a damn good job or no one's going to buy your shit and you're going to go out of business so yeah so it's yeah, like pretty much. I and mean, innovation is created in that setting too, you know? Like yeah. finding more efficient ways to do the same thing at a lesser cost, and that's good for everybody. Right. Less waste. Waste is a loss, yeah. always. Yeah. And there are many forms of waste, and uh sometimes our government can be kind of wasteful. <laughs> I agree. I'm 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 wondering what things the government is doing that could be <laughs> could be privatized to be better. I'm not sure what it would could be, but um, I've got a good one for you, I think. What's that? Uh, the FDA, regulations on drugs and stuff like that. Drugs, food. Okay. How, how, how would that be better? Because okay. I already see some problems if that's privatized, but I want to hear so, your, your side first. The way, the current, how do I explain this? All right. And this is not my original idea. I, I forget who showed me this, but it was... Um, no one has an original idea anymore. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you, you read stuff, you hear it. If you are just sitting around to come up with an idea, you're who does that? Like Ben Franklin does that. No one else. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> so essentially, what we have right now is one body that has a monopoly on an industry. They have they have these drugs, they or food or whatever. They test them to make sure they're safe, and then they pass them on to the public. But here's the thing. They're not always safe. We know that sometimes the FDA approves things that are outrageous. Yeah. And they're not always approved in a quick, timely manner. What you can do to fix both those problems is to allow private companies to do the same function as that. Because then there's incentive. Based. So um, what it would be like is it would be a you, you produce a product. You're a, a person who makes bottles. or I don't know. No, you make drugs. You give them to this company, they approve them or don't, and they like put their seal of approval on it, you know, like a mark, and yep. then they pass it along to markets for the consumer, and they they are basically saying this is good, and it my name is attached to that. Sure, right, yeah. which is what the FDA does. Yeah, but because we have no alternative to the FDA, they don't have to do it fast because there's no one who's going to take their business from them if they do. And they don't have to do a good job because, once again, there's no competition. Lack of competition is always bad for the consumer. Yeah. But, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I, 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 I agree with what you're saying. And, you know, obviously it would work because if they do approve some, if a private company approves a drug that is, you know, ends up killing a bunch of people, well, that company's reputation has gone to shit and exactly. no one cares. And no anymore. one wants to do business with them anymore. Or the things that they put through onto the market are not going to be bought. They've, they've done a bad job. Like you were saying, you have to do a good job when you're doing it for yourself and for money. Right. But at the same time, when it is private, it opens it up to corruption. 
you know, you, I would I would argue that keeping competition out of it has opened it up to the same, if not worse, corruption. Because we we all know that, or maybe we don't all know, but um, <laughs> drug companies and their and patents and stuff make huge contributions they, to they, yeah, exactly. lobbying and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah no, these that's, are powerful people you're talking about, and now yeah. you've what you've done is you've put them in a place where they can wield that power. In, yeah. a, in a way that's sort of behind the scenes, and that's very dangerous to all of us. Right, it, it is. But at the, I agree with that. But then as you see, for example, the, the, the credit rating agencies um, that rated in, in the 2008 mm-hmm. collapse, you know, they rated kind of these junk investments or these very junk investments with AAA <laughs> ratings, right? Yeah. As, you know, they were essentially an FDA, right? They, they put their mark on something and said, this is good. It's, theirs was just financial service, you know, financial investments instead of, you know, food or drugs. Right. And they were just getting, you know, they were getting kickbacks by the banks who were selling these. And they're like, hey, we'll pay you tons of money if you, if you put your stamp of approval on this. So that corruption led, you know, that, that was a big reason that, that all that collapse happened is you had people, you know, people's 401ks and, and retirement plans are being invested in, in what looked like very secure, safe investments, but really was absolute trash. And you, your point of their reputation is, you know, you would think that the, the credit rated agency wouldn't do that, but if you pay them enough, they're like, well, fuck it. Like, why wouldn't I? You know, it's like, this is worth it. it like, <laughs> Yeah, sort of like go out in a blaze of glory. and Yeah, and then, I mean, they didn't even go out in a blaze of glory, right? They're still around, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, we fucked up. My bad. And yeah, people just I, move on. I don't have an answer for any any of the the things that we as a as a nation did in light of finding this information out. Um, I think... I don't know what to say. Like, I could. It could be that I'm just wrong. No, I, 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 I don't think you. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong or anything. I mean, I don't know either. It's just I'm playing devil's advocate a bit. Of is there, is there a good solution? Because both both sides, you know, seem to have their drawbacks, right? You know, if if things are handed in the public sector, there's inefficiency and and you know things are going to wait, like the FDA example, but yet the same similar business model in a private sector mm-hmm. is, you know, open to, you know, this, this type of corruption, but yet the public sector is open to corruption too. So, yeah. And I guess, I guess, um, I don't, I can't say that there's no corruption in private industry because I'd be the biggest idiot in the world. But, um, if the same, if the same problems exist in two industries and one is better than the other, like a more efficient version of the, if the private sector is more efficient and than the public one, and they have they're susceptible to the same problems, still why go with the public one? Yeah, well, I think what we could do, right, is if you eliminate this 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 you know connection between uh, private industry and politics in the public sector, that I think that would solve a ton of issues. You know, if Pfizer can't get what they want through the FDA, through, you know, various backdoor channels and like, you know, contributing to certain politicians' funds and all this kind of stuff. If they can't, if companies can't buy influence in politics, then the the government is literally there to, you know, the, their motivation then is not, there's no monetary motivation there and they could really look out for the benefits of the people that elected them, you know? Yeah. That's I I I can't believe we had like that's still allowed like the 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 Supreme Court ruling that corporations are people is <laughs> fucked like that it's that's a huge laughable. deal yeah and it's also call I think it causes so many problems you know it's like no oh, it's they're a not huge amount of problems <laughs> yeah because um, then you get people the people who are in charge of these companies um do- making donations in the name of the company but like. What about the other people that work at that company, you know? Yeah, exactly. They're not people. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a person. It's a, a giant group of people. Yeah. And it's... I think as like as a private person, you should be able to do whatever you want with your money, more or less. But 
when you expand those same freedoms and you can extrapolate that to any any human freedom that we are afforded when you start allowing that to a company um well you're, you're screwed <laughs> yeah i i agree i i think it's such a bad decision uh, it's just uh, uh, I don't know if like Supreme Court justices get kickbacks. That would be a huge scandal or something. But <laughs> but maybe they did because that that just seems so wrong to me. Um, on I mean, of course these these Supreme Court justices know way more about the law than I do. But it seems just like it, <laughs> it seems like that's something that just like causes so many problems. Like what are the benefits compared? Like the pros and cons of that decision. What are the pros? I don't really see any. You know. Yeah, I I don't know why people thought that was a good idea. Yeah, right? It's like corporations are becoming so freaking powerful. And you think about it, it's just, what are they? They're like things we like, humans have created and we, we go and work for them and they pay us and, you know, it's like, <laughs> they're just us. They're like things other like humans have created and yet they have these legal rights and, and, and properties and, and it's like... It's like what? Like this is, let's, let's step back. Like you know, it's like yeah, yeah, definitely. It's just it's crazy. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. I don't know, man. I don't know what we're gonna do. I don't know if hopefully someone smarter than us comes along, to <laughs> just fix everything. Until then, just I don't know, buy gold or some shit. <laughs> Sound financial advice from Justin Timlin. <laughs> well, people always say buy gold, right? Yeah. But I always think, you know, if a if a if society as we know it completely collapses, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. What am I going to do with like a bar of gold? Like, is someone going to give me food for this gold? No. What are you going to do with like a fistful of paper? Yeah, if it's society collapses. Like, exactly. If society seems, collapses, we're screwed. I don't know. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But people are like, oh, no, everything's like gold's going to like go through it because gold is always good. Well, it's like gold is just money before there was money. Like, I mean, there's a finite <laughs> amount of it which changes the equation, but it's not a useful thing, really. No, you'd think copper would be like the treasured commodity. Copper is way more useful. Yeah, I'm investing in some shit that people can use every day. Like, I'm investing in freaking, I don't know, like microwave pizzas. Like everyone, <laughs> everyone's going to need those. It's like, yeah, I got Twinkies. I got a food supply for 20 years. Like, <laughs> and I'm going to make, I'm going to trade that for whatever I need because everyone else needs to eat. So, hey dude, build me a house because you're a carpenter and I will give you like 20 Twinkies or, well, probably not, but you know what I mean? <laughs> like a much more basic need is what I would be investing in. Like inelastic commodities. Yes, exactly. Hell yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess. I mean, what, like, you could just buy a shitload of houses or something. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. You That's, could... you know, property, but then again, that leads us back to the housing bubble, and nothing is really a, a perfect investment, I guess. Nah, guess not. Invest in yourself, Justin. That's, that's what, yeah. I'm, Take I'm... some yoga classes, <laughs> get that heart rate down. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did yoga the other day. I was on a business <laughs> business conference, and there was this woman there called the Yoga CEO, and she just she just convinced me to like take a yoga class with her at seven in the morning the next day. I, I really? Yeah, it was like office yoga, so it's like all stuff you can do at your desk. So, so it's like it was pretty cool. It was like cool ways to stretch yeah, at your chair cool. and stuff. Yeah, it, it was cool. I'm right. surprised you got up at seven in the morning for it. Uh yeah. Me uh me too. It's not really morning. Who knows, man? I don't know. But all right, man. Well, this is probably a good time to wrap it up. But um yeah, man, thanks for coming on. A blast as always. So <laughs> Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, good talking with you. And you know, maybe we'll we'll solve the economy one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Alright, sounds good, man. I'll talk to you soon. Alright, take it easy, brother. See you later. Yeah. Mama told me one day I'm gonna grow up big and I'm gonna be a king. And my papa told me it's okay to say what shit hurts. Don't forget your dreams because they'll get you through this. So called life, they call living, but I call it strange. And I bet I'll do it because I'm on my way and strong enough that yeah. I can shake the pain. Hey.
Mr. Sunshine, Mr. Rainstorm Meet me in the conference room, we need to brainstorm Need some middle ground, need an even keel But you're a war, pick up sides, give me fever chills Take a both like my flu shot broke I need to give and take to keep me out of that moat My head above water, thoughts of those lost this week All the tragedies say on repeat like we can't shake shit I can't speak on it, fist to the sky but I can't beat on it Drinking my cup so I'm gonna sip on them Cam Newt's probably pissed, he can't stiff on them All these levels of these relative problems and benevolent elegance for those who can solve them. I'm feeling pretty low, like I'm stuck at the bottom, but I know I'll rebound like the bulls with rhyme, and I am just exactly what I will be. Just a guy who can rhyme and chop ill beats. One day I'll recover from what ails me. Till then I'm on that fuck with the sales beat.